Our second area of study in working with radicals is multiplying and dividing radical expressions. So let's start with the multiplication rule. If you have the nth root of a times the nth root of b, this is equal to the nth root of a times b. So if you're taking, as long as it's the same roots, two square roots, two cubed roots, two fourth roots, and items are being multiplied by each other, you can simply multiply the radicands and then take the root of the resultant product. So an example, we have the fourth root of 8 times the fourth root of 2. Well, this is going to simplify into being the fourth root of 8 times 2. This is the fourth root of 16, which that's the fourth root of 2 to the fourth. So our answer is simply 2. Looking at it on the next one, the cubed root of 9 times the cubed root of 81. Well, the cubed root of 9 we cannot work with, that's 9 squared. The cubed root of 81 we could simplify a little bit, so we'll take the cubed root of 9 times cubed root of 81 is going to give us 3 cubed root of 3, because 81 is 3 to the fourth power. So we took three of those to get our expression outside and we had one left behind. Now we're going to take multiply our resulting. So we have three times the cubed root of nine times three. That's three cubed root of twenty seven. Twenty cubed root of twenty seven is another three, so we have three times three, giving us a product of nine. So we might not be able to take the radical that's being asked of a given number, but if you combine it with others, it becomes something that can be useful. Let's take a look at being able to reverse this process, because if we can multiply individual radicals together, then we could just as easily break one up. So if we're asked to take the cubed root of 120, oh, sorry, 250 x to the fourth. This is going to be the cubed root of two times five cubed. The way I got that is the 250. 250. If we factor this down, it's two and 125. 125 is five, five, and five. So we took the and that's 5 cubed and 2. Then we have x to the 4th, which comes out to be x times x cubed. The reason I break it like this is we're looking for groups of 3, so I pulled out 3 and left behind. Now, if I were to take this 5, five cubed and work the cubed root of it, I end up with just a 5. Next, if I take the cubed root of x cubed, I will get simply x. Now, what does that leave behind? It leaves me a cubed root of 2 times x. So, the cubed root of 250x to the fourth is 5x times the cubed root of x squared. Being able to work both ways becomes very important so that we can either create items that are useful or take something that's too large and break it down into pieces that are useful and see what we have left behind. And we worked with this when we had square roots. A reminder of this process is if we took the square root, sorry about that, the square root of 50, this was equal to the square root of 25 times the square root of 2, so we got an answer of 5 root 2. Same process here, just we're dealing with higher order indices, uh, taking items other than just the square root. Now, we can also look at this for, from a division. If we have the nth root of a divided by the nth root of b, then what this is going to give us is the nth root of a divided by b. So we might not be able to take individual pieces, but again, when combining them, it might make something more useful. Example, 
if we take the third root of 108 divided by the third root of 4, this is the third root of 108 fourths, which is 108 divided by 4. We get the third root of 27. 27 we can take a cubed root of, and we get simply 3. The fourth root of 3125x to the seventh divided by the fourth root of 5x, this is going to simplify into the fourth root of 3125x to the seventh over 5x. Now going through and starting to simplify, 3125 divided by 5 is 625 x to the seventh divided by x would give us x to the sixth. Applying our product rule now, I would end up with the fourth root of five times five cubed. 625 is five to the fourth, so we break it out. Oh, sorry, never mind that. We're looking for fourth roots now, so we have the fourth root of 5 to the fourth. And then if we take the fourth root of x to the sixth, well, that's an x to the fourth times x squared. Again, we take the fourth root of 5 to the fourth, and we end up with just 5. Take the fourth root of x to the fourth, and we are going to end up with the absolute value of x. That way, if x was negative, we don't have to worry about having taken an even root of a negative number. And what's left behind is the fourth root of x squared. Now, there will be a process for simplifying this later, but we will get to that when it comes. Our last thing is applying the principles here that we use other places. When we were dealing primarily with square roots, we had a rule called rationalizing the denominator. We were not allowed to leave uh, radicals in our denominators. So being able to use this principle and applying multiplication and division will help us out. So if I have 1 over the square root of 3, reminder that this square root has an index of 2. So I'm looking for pairs of the same items. I cannot leave a radical in my denominator, so I need to make it so I get rid of it. I need two of a single item, that's what my index tells me, and my item in there is this 3. So what I need to do is put another 3 down there. So I'm going to multiply this by the square root of 3 divided by the square root of 3. In my numerator, that gives me square root of 3. In my denominator, that gives me the square root of 3 squared. Square root and square will cancel each other out. They're inverse operations. So this gives me the square root of 3 divided by 3. I now have a value that is equivalent to what I began with, but without having a radical in the denominator. Now when we deal with higher orders, we have to look at it a little bit differently. So, let's break down the cubed root of 15x squared over 4y. Well, this is going to be the cubed root of 15x squared divided by the cubed root of 4y. Making this something more compatible to look at, we have the cubed root of 15x squared over the cubed root of 2 squared y. Now, as my index indicates, I'm looking for groups of 3 in this denominator. Right now, I have two 2's and a single y. So, I'm going to have to multiply this by the number 1 in a way that will get rid of that denominator. So, it'll be a cubed root. How many more twos do I need in order to have a full complement? Well, I have two of them. I need three. So that gives me one more two. Then how many more y's do I need? I currently have one. I need three, so I need another two in there. So I'm going to multiply by the cubed root of 2y squared. When I multiply this, my numerators 
I'll go 15 times 2, and we'll multiply my normal uh, rational numbers, and that will give me the cubed root, 15 times 2 is 30. X's, I only have the X squared, and Y's, I only have the Y squared, so those will remain separate. I will have 30X squared, Y squared. Now for my denominator, I now have the cubed root of 2 cubed, y cubed. And then going through simplifying this one step further, my numerator will not change. I have 30x squared, y squared, divided by 2y. When I take the cubed root of 2 cubed, I get 2, and the cubed root of y cubed, I end up with just y. So this is a simplified form that does not involve radicals in my denominator anymore. So multiplying and dividing radical expressions follow a lot of the same patterns that we were dealing with when we had imaginary numbers or complex numbers. So go back and review this as needed and be ready to work with it as we move forward in Algebra 2.